Hi, my name is Amanda Clark, and I am a the former events coordinator for the Novel Neighbor, and currently, um, it, so my name is Amanda Clark, and I'm the former events coordinator for the Novel Neighbor, and currently an employee at large. I, I don't think you ever truly leave from working at the Novel Neighbor, um, and I am really excited tonight to be here to talk to. Um, Anne Lemons Pollock about her new book uh, about iconic St. Louis uh, St. Louis restaurants. Um, yeah, so as soon as Anne is here, we can start chatting about her book. Um, kind of background on her on her. She was a restaurant reviewer. She traveled around, uh, has done lots of food writing, and was married to the uh, to the restaurant critic of the St. Louis Post Dispatch. Um, and they've wrote several books together um, as well. Hi, I'm really happy to be here. Hi, Ian. <laughs> so tell me about your book. <laughs> they all start that way, right? Um, yeah, so tell me, I have always asked, you know, my, myself, I'm a St. Louis historian, and that's my um, my daytime job is St. Louis history. So, and the first question I always ask everybody is when I'm giving talks and stuff is, are you from St. Louis? I'm from about 65 miles south of here. I was raised in Missouri's old lead belt, St. Francis County, mm -hmm. uh, Deloge High School for anybody who asks. Um, and I came to St. Louis for the last time in 1972. I'd lived here off and on for um, about 10 years and made the final move in 72 in, into Laclede town of blessed memory. Interesting. So yeah, Lake Town has a great history for anyone that doesn't know that's that was one of the federal housing projects that was built in the middle of the 20th century, but it has a great history and it was middle income housing. Mm -hmm. And it was so culturally diverse. My kids had babysitters from Ghana and Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, and the smells coming out of the houses around me were pretty fine. I'm here to tell you. Interesting. Is that something you think that, that led you to what you do now and the interest that you have? No, what led me to, there There were, I was a picky eater as a kid, but there were hints mm -hmm. uh, in, in picture books before I was reading. The ones I liked best, I clearly remember a picture of a candy store mm -hmm. with the, the counters and the colors and the dishes and, you know, and the various confections and all. But um, I will, uh, by profession, I'm a, I'm a nurse, and my old line is, hospital food drove me to to becoming an, an adventurous eater. Yeah, <laughs> just because it was so adventurous itself, or, <laughs> or no. it was it was it was so bad and so bland that I was sort of forced into it. And the other thing was I found myself in an environment where people were talking more about really interesting food because I was at Barnes and I was working around people from big cities on both coasts. Mm -hmm. And late at night in the ICU, there'd be conversations about the best Italian restaurant in Boston or mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So I got more adventurous and um, one thing led to another. And my first writing gig was for a magazine in New Orleans. Really? Tell me about that. I was a divorced mom, and um, back then, about once a year, if I saved my pennies, I could pop for the $99 airfare to New Orleans, and there was a hotel that was run by some people from central Missouri, and there was there were a couple of New Orleans restaurant books that I had read that really got me hip to on this, and I got went down there and began to much more clearly think about what I was eating. And nobody would watch me if I took, if I ate a raw oyster and laugh at me and go, mom's eating or whatever. And um, eventually I made connections with a guy who was sort of trying to set up an eating club in New Orleans and he was a, a food critic himself. Mm -hmm. And he never got the eating club set up, but we got to know each other and he began his own publication and started publishing my letters to him, which were really not meant for public consumption. <laughs> That's interesting. So many great, I, so many writers have that 
like kind of a start of I was sending letters home and they got published or you know or something. You know, these that's a that's a cool connection to have. Um, so how did you get? So okay, so you're doing you're a nurse, you're in St. Louis, you go to New Orleans and you're writing about food. What? How do you get started in food writing in St. Louis? Um, Tom, when, what I, when I had said to Tom, I don't, you know, that wasn't meant for you to be publishing. And his response was, well, write me something I can use. And at that time, there was a, a, a new, very modest publication called St. Louis Dining that had come out. And at first I was sort of like, with with the arrogance of the rookie, I was sort of like, oh, I don't want to do that. And then I realized that I had an idea for something that might work for them. And I called them up and my, you know, I, I said, hello, my name is Ann Lemons. And I, and the guy on the other end of the phone said, Ann Lemons, we've been looking for you. <laughs> He had gone to seminary in New Orleans. He subscribed to my friend's publication uh, and it very clearly said I lived in St. Louis. And because my phone was not listed as a woman living alone with children, I didn't have it listed that way. He couldn't find me. Because this was not on Facebook, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, let me see. This would have been about 82. Yeah. Yeah. So um, one thing led to another. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how that's how I fell into it. Yeah. So, um, and what was so? I know that you have lost restaurants of St. Louis, and you have the the new and the iconic restaurants. Are there other books about St. Louis food that you've written? Uh, I co-wrote uh, with Joe, uh, my late husband, who was the first who was the restaurant critic at the Post-Dispatch, um, Beyond Gooey Butter Cake and Beyond Toasted Ravioli and the Great St. Louis Eats book. And all of those are restaurant review books. There's some other stuff in there, but mostly it's restaurant reviews. And with your late husband being the, the food critic, is that a, a, I have a chicken and egg question, which, you know, as far as like, with the writing and getting into the St. Louis restaurant like, scene and all that, how did you guys meet? Was it connected over that? Of course it was over food, no question about it. Um, uh, he always swore we met at a root beer tasting, but that isn't really true. Um, <laughs> but it's romantic. It was in the World's Fair Pavilion on a beautiful spring day, but we knew each other before that. My friend in New Orleans had just put together and brought out New Orleans 100 Best Restaurants. And he had some subscribers here in St. Louis, but he thought if he got more publicity, he could sell more copies of this particular soft cover book, which he had self-published. And he sent me back to St. Louis. I was, I was in New Orleans when the great blizzard of, what was that, about 85 hit. Oh, okay. And I came back from that into the snow and was prepared to go to people like Joe Pollock at the Post-Dispatch and Jack Carney and people like that to try to get some mileage on this. So the first time I laid eyes on JP was outside the elevator on the fifth floor of the old Post-Dispatch building. Mm -hmm. And he was interested in the book. And that's how we met. That's how that goes. <laughs> um. So and now that I've asked a lot of personal questions, I should probably move on to book questions. <laughs> um, so what I loved about reading reading this, the iconic restaurants book is I'm not from St. Louis. And so I, a lot of these restaurants, some of them I, I can still go to, obviously, and I know them, but hearing the backstories on them were was fantastic. And I, you know, I don't have a, any nostalgic history and the talks that I give and the, the work I do, there's no nostalgia in it because I wasn't here for that piece. Um, tell me how, like when writing about these restaurants, balancing, learning the family stories, the, the, the people part, the, I don't know, maybe get, maybe tell me like what were your favorite ones or one where, you know, how do you get that information and then balance it with the history and the facts? And I don't know that I consciously balance, but, um, and, and the first book, 
was quite specifically my publisher. These these are both part of a series from my publisher, Arcadia Publishing, and um, uh, Lost Restaurants. They said you can put in a few current restaurants, but not very many, mm -hmm. and they need to be really old. So I put in Bevo Mill and um, Crown Candy and Al's, the steakhouse downtown, ABC. <laughs> and um, I got, I, a lot of people said, oh, why didn't you put this in? Why didn't you put that in? And my old line was, well, that's the next book. But you have to choose. And at first it seems like there's not enough. And then suddenly you realize there's too many. Yeah. And so there was that. And when they approached me, to my surprise, to write the second one, uh, and they said, we want iconic restaurants of St. Louis. And because in that book, I had written about places like Tony Faust's that was just this great historic St. Louis restaurant that was nationally known. I mean, they were bringing seafood up the river from New Orleans because by that time there were ice making machines. Very important. It's super. <laughs> and um, well, seafood, no ice, up upstream in the Mississippi. Yeah, I always wondered. I, like I try to think about how they did it then. Whenever I like look at Tony Faust stuff, and I'm like, how did? Yeah. It's amazing. They even they they had a retail section that sold things like curry powder. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so I'm thinking, I've written about the iconic restaurants, but the difference here was that I could write about restaurants that were still open, and most of the restaurants in in iconic restaurants of St. Louis are still open. Uh, there are there are some that have closed. Um, and um, there are um, there are some. I've only lost one. Mm -hmm. I sent the manuscript off the day the restaurants all closed. The only place that has that has closed on me, I think, is Cusinelli's in okay. South in in Lime, and that's got a history to it. Yeah. Um, General Lafayette. Mm -hmm. um, Just but. So <laughs> but he, but but, I basically looked for places that kind of stood for other things, and I didn't come to the realization that there was a theme here until I was fairly far along, and the theme unwittingly turns out to be to be families, mm -hmm. because pretty much all of these are family restaurants. How hard it is to open a restaurant. Um, people that don't get into it think it's really glamorous and you'll have fun picking out the curtains and choosing the menu. But as Joe used to say, the owner has to be able to wash the dishes. You can't ask the chef to wash the dishes. Hmm. So there's this, this story of families from various backgrounds, from various parts of the world. There's old St. Louis and there's new St. Louis but there is always or nearly always this theme of families working together, saving their money, working hard and trying to share their hospitality and their warmth by way of food, mm -hmm. the great commonality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that going through it, like the ones that were still owned by the family or and how they adapted over time, I felt was interesting, you know, the what, you know, um, is it Kimmel's that's now out at Westport? You know, it's just mm -hmm. interesting to me because it's um, just to go that tr that trip right from downtown to <laughs> Westport. <laughs> and of course, they began before downtown. They were originally in North St. Louis, up near the water tower, oh. when when Sportsman's Park, okay. uh, the old old Bush Stadium, uh, when Sportsman's Park was there, um, they were north of Fairgrounds Park. And um, they were putting out stuff uh, before the before the uh, Second World War, mm -hmm. and it was family owned. And they worked hard, and they saved their money, and the restaurant grew, and they moved into the building living over the store, and then they bought the building and all of the apartments in it, and it's still in family hands. They moved downtown when the when when they tore down sportsman's park and after they built the new bush stadium all of the professional sports went 
with it. But the, they liked athletes and athletes liked them. And that's when they started something called Gourmet Nights. Uh, one of the family members said he couldn't expect people to come up here for just an ordinary restaurant. Mm -hmm. By then, it was kind of off the beaten path for people who wanted an upper middle class or an upper class restaurant experience. So they began offering these special nights with a special mem menu, um, a fixed price menu with exotic things that they had researched. And originally, it was from various areas of Italy, and then they expanded and uh, the athlete types came back for that too. Yeah, and also I had the Piccadilly on Manhattan. That that place is so magic, and there's a magic there. There's something magical that, you know, I went for the first time a few years ago, someone gave me a gift certificate out of nowhere. And I was like, what even is that? I don't even know what this place is. And it sat like on my desk for a while. And then I went and it was so surprising you know, surprise, it's such an amazing place tucked away in that, that neighborhood. But then I read in your book, 1901. This one. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, like, tell me some more about Piccadilly. <laughs> well, Piccadilly, um, it, for a while it was called the buffet, but there was a time when small restaurants slash almost taverns used that name. Years ago, I lived in Carondelet, um, many years ago, before I was a nurse even. And there were still a few places advertising in a publication called The Neighborhood News that uh, called themselves the blah, blah, blah buffet, advertising bid businessmen's lunches. Mm -hmm. And I was never in those places, although I was very curious about them, but I was young and poor and, and, and didn't do that. Plus I had a small child at that point. Mm -hmm. But um, buffets then obviously meant something different in terms of restaurant presentation. So it was there and eventually, you know, things grew and it enlarged. It opened in 1901 and I like to think about its early years going on while they're planning the World's Fair. There's, there's just this, this parallel thing that's great fun. So you go and you eat fried chicken or smoked, uh, 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 smoked steak on a sandwich and you have the cobbler of the of the quarter yeah. for lunch and or, or maybe you go have brunch out on the patio when the weather is nice on the back porch really that's that's just so much fun and it feels so neighborhoody yeah it, it i was yeah like i said i was so surprised when i saw that place for the first time and to go in um it's really and anytime i've taken someone there i, I always make sure i take someone there for the first time. I don't think I've ever taken anyone there for the second time. Like I like to be the one to take someone to, to see this place and be like, I got a surprise for you. Let me see this. Um, are you going to see this? Um, so of course there's the easy question of well, what didn't make the list, but something I um, would love to ask about is something like St. Raymond's, like, and how like, like the buffet, you say buffet, like how would something like that fit? Would something, you know, an eating experience like that. That's so, well, it's St. Raymond's is a great thing, but it's like the fish fries. It's not a restaurant. Yeah. I mean, I really stretched two of my usual parameters here. Mm -hmm. At least I say usual, the ones I used for the first book. First of all, I have um, a couple of chains in there, very small chains. Um, and... Um, one of them is Emo's because I think Emo's is iconic and I'm not going to argue. There's a very famous pizza writer who says there is no bad pizza. There is only some pizza that's better than others. I think there's a Provel cheese gene. <laughs> I would believe that. <laughs> um, and I, I have my, my grandchildren, none of whom were raised in St. Louis, all have it. Yeah. Uh, I can't explain this, but this is the ritual first night supper. I don't have to have food waiting for them. I have to have the telephone waiting. <laughs> um, and the other thing that's kind of out of the line of that is, um, and here again is kind of an exception, I have Miss Hullings and I have the Forum cafeterias, okay. both of those. And Miss Hullings was local, of course, and it's kind of a stretch to call it a chain, but the forum was definitely a chain and nobody seemed to realize it. I didn't know it until I started yeah. researching. Miss Holland, yeah, I've, as someone who's not from here and has only been here in recent years, I only know that as a great 
piece of cake you can get at Straub's, you know, is because they have that that cake there. So I was happy to see oh. that on there. Um, yeah, I don't have the Provel gene at all. And uh, in fact, I moved here 16 years ago when I was pregnant with my first child. And that was the one food I could not eat was Provel cheese. Like my body was like, nope, that's it. <laughs> the one thing. Well, we all have those things. I will tell you that that uh, my grandchildren tell me that this makes a great grilled cheese sandwich. It's gooey without stretching out the way mozzarella does. And I think that's part of the secret of its success. St. Louis likes tidy. Mozzarella is not tidy, but Provel is. <laughs> Um, and I saw the Ed Ted Drews on there. I guess that was maybe a required. Pretty much. That's yeah, truly yeah. iconic. First, yeah. <laughs> Can't get much more iconic than that. That's sure. right. I had thought about, you know, for when I knew we were going to be doing this, I was going to be eating some Ted Drews while you were, while you were talking. It's the beauty of doing these from home. I can do fun stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. But you got to have red hot ripplets with the Ted Drews. With the Ted Drews. That's a good idea. <laughs> I mean, wait, I'm thinking, making a whole big crazy thing here now. Um, Today I gave a tour and there were some people from um, from Chicago visiting and they were staying in the hill and I sent them to Joe Fossey's, uh, the sandwich place, right? Because there's so much history connected to it and it's a good sandwich um, as well. You know, it's a place that has some some interesting stuff there. So tell me, yeah, I mean, and then you have like Union Station stuff. Can you tell me more oh. about the Fred, the Fred Harvey stuff? I mean, that I can never hear enough about that Fred Harvey story. Well... First of all, Fred Harvey was in St. Louis long before he became Fred Harvey. Mm -hmm. He had a business here that um, apparently because of some unscru an unscrupulous partner, he lost his shirt on. Mm -hmm. He was an Englishman and he went to work for the railroads and um, just, just as kind of the, the West was opening up. And I say in the book that he may have been as responsible for opening the West up as uh, the Colt Revolver or something. Um, he, he understood that food and travel should be linked. Before him, it was just a disaster, but he became, um, he, he began setting up dining rooms and he went, he would get, uh, silver from England and fine Irish linens. And um, he had a standard book of recipes, um, not, not unlike, um, uh, uh, I'm losing a name here, uh, mm, uh, the, the, uh, the Hollings family, for example. But on the other hand, he was also open to if, for example, somebody came in and said, I've got a dozen quail here to the chef. He was fine, you know, use the local stuff as well. And of course, he did a lot of other fabulous places farther west um, uh, through New Mexico and Arizona in particular, along all along the, uh, the Santa Fe Railroad trails. But the place here he was involved in in when this when this station was being built and not only did he have the dining room he also had in effect a coffee shop on the lower level on the trains level and uh one of the nice things i've got is a couple of fred harvey recipes in the book the book has about a dozen recipes in it and i'm here to tell you i have not tested the recipes um <laughs> I, I, I had my hands full as it was, but um, uh, included in that is one of Harry Truman's favorite deals. And of course, Harry Truman um, frequented Union Station. He went back and forth between Kansas City, pardon me, Independence, <laughs> I was born there, and Washington DC on the train, and he had to change in St. Louis. So he knew Union Station and he was very fond of the uh, of the cheese soup. So the recipe for that is in the book. But he was kind of a plain eater, generally speaking. Harry was a, a big guy for a nice ham and cheese sandwich. <laughs> but this was before Provel, so. Yeah. So anyway, was, go ahead. I loved reading, oh, I loved it when you had the, the part about um, Union Station. You have these great little histories of other things that you 
put in there. And I love that you pointed out that Union Station is called Union Station because all the trains met, you know, it, you, it served multiple train lines and little little facts like that that I think are lost, um, you know, are just lost in the, the general histories of those um, those types of buildings. I, I love that that was in there. That's a, that's a, pers a personal thing. I have a friend who's a train buff and he nudges me on those things. Um, <laughs> the, the other interesting local angle on that is that um, Angelica Uniforms, which is an old St. Louis company, has a St. Louis Union Station tie. Um, uh, there was a chef, a chef named Angelico, who uh, Angelica, the feminine form of the name, apparently not with an O at the end. And his chef's whites were apparently particularly nice. His wife made them. And Harvey saw those chef's whites. He was working for, uh, he was working for one of the railroads and, and Harvey had his finger in the railroad dining rooms as well. And uh, basically he persuaded the Angelica family to start making uniforms for his restaurants. Mm -hmm. And that's how the Angelica company started. So I don't know if they made the costumes for Judy Garland when she played one of the Harvey girls or not, but, but it's a nice tie in. There's, there's a lot of ghosts at Union Station and it's lovely to go back there now and to be able to sit and look around at this gorgeous, gorgeous building. And now you can sit in the Grand Hall and not only have a drink, but have a bite to eat. Mm -hmm. so. And watch the light show. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that, <light's That's> <laughs> that room though, mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago was named one of the most beautiful in the United States. Mm -hmm. The Grand Hall is just so splendid. And one of my pleasures, it's always good to take people to see something new that you know they'll like. One of my great pleasures is bringing people in and starting them off with the stained glass window with three, the three women representing the city and indeed the whispering arch and then taking them upstairs into the Grand Hall and watching their face. Yeah. It's Good the best. You know, like, yeah, it's, it, you know, my full time job is touring, and yeah, that is that is a really special thing to get to take people to see. Um, but oh, that made me think. I had a question. Of, oh, but like other, can are there any other good examples like that of auxiliary, either companies or products or things that came out of any of these iconic, like the uniforms or um, a patented something or another that. Well, was there was more of that, of course, that came out of the World's Fair, which is in the first book and which was a stunning revelation to me in terms of the number of huge restaurants. There were at least four or five restaurants that would seat 2,000 people at a time. It's, it's unbelievable. It really is. And there were a lot of products that came out of there. I'll have to reach a little to think to, to, to come up with other connections on that. But as, as they flicker through my squash, <laughs> Oh, You're thinking uh, it like in the middle of the night and be like, oh, me, <laughs> you know that thing. Yeah, well, maybe it'll even before, be before we get done here. Yeah. But yeah. but the, for example, other tidbits, Annie Guns is the first restaurant in the book. And Annie's, of course, was totally inundated when the levees broke in um, 93, I guess it was, yes. And they had paid the mortgage off early two weeks before the flood. Oh my God. Yes, yes. Tom Sainert, who is a lovely man and who owns Annie's, and, with, and he would insist I include his lovely wife, Jane, who is very much full partner in that. Um, Tom Sainert got me, I was hoping to get a picture, the classic picture of Tom being rescued from the roof of the restaurant by a helicopter. Oh, you talk about down with your ship. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was, I don't know if it was, a, if it was a military chopper or if it was like channel force chopper getting him off. Um, but there is a picture of Annie's in the smokehouse, you know, over and over your head with water. That's the, it's the first photo in the book. Um, and you know, how they got through that and got out, um, is is just an amazing story the the tidbits in terms of that and how they've come back with such a bang mm -hmm. and it's similar and the, like the 
a, kind of in a disaster vein, like the goody goody. Is it the goody goody diner that burned? Which is which is the one? Yes. That, yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, it's just it's just really sad. Goody goody was like Laclede Town. Everybody went there. Everybody was equal. It was fun. It wasn't expensive. It was a tradition. And um, uh, since the book closed, um, the remains of the restaurant um, are, are being taken, are being demolished. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have no line on what's going to happen there. I have looked hard to try to track down the people that own it, and I have gotten bupkis. Hmm. And it's it's so sad. I think about those longtime employees, and I know that when the family that owned it sold it, they were convinced that these were the right people and their employees were going to be in good shape. I mean, who else has a rhyming major D? <laughs> wow. So, Sly the Mater D would do poetry in the style of Muhammad Ali. Really? See, I don't, see again, yeah. I grew up here, so I don't know any. I don't know any of this. But there's a place in New Orleans that is a diner um, uptown called the Camellia Grill. It's 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 uh, uptown from Tulane and Loyola, and they have a Mater D and they have linen napkins, but he doesn't rhyme the way Sly did. <laughs> well, who are some other? characters that aren't the restaurant, but, uh, you know, who are some dining characters that you could can pull out? Like either an owner that was a big personality or any other maitre d's that, if you were to write a book of, of the maitre d's. <laughs> oh, the maitre, the maitre d's in St. Louis had to have been led by Herb Cray. Mm -hmm. Herb was the maitre d at Tony's for many years. And I admit that I'm not unbiased because Herb announced the birth of my of of my oldest child's oldest child, <laughs> he came to the table. I knew my daughter-in-law was in Georgetown Hospital in Washington D.C., mm -hmm. and it was my husband's birthday. And my darling mother-in-law, and I'm not being sarcastic. Joe's mother was fabulous, <laughs> and Joe and I had gone to dinner at Tony's for his birthday. And I told my son where we were going to be. And after a while, Herb approaches the table in his silver haired dignity. And he looks at me and he smiles and he says, Mrs. Pollock, you have a phone call. <laughs> and I said, oh, OK. And he said, and if I may, it's a boy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> what a great story. Herb was, Herb was the epitome of poise. He was good to the kids that came in for prom night and were afraid. He carried off senators and media people without breaking a sweat or raising an eyebrow. Mm -hmm. um, he was totally unflappable. I am sure if someone had collapsed with um, a massive heart attack in the middle of the dining room, Herb would have moved to call 911 with a plum. Yeah. <laughs> he might have moved a little faster, but I mean, there was just, he was totally unflappable. Um, and uh, in a different way, so was so was his boss, the late Vince Bomarito. Um, Vince was a little guy physically. Yeah. And, but he, watching him watch the dining room, was just such an experience. He didn't miss anything and he would come to the tables and he would not just come to the tables of the people that he knew, he would make the rounds. But, and he was looking and he was talking and, you know, did you, you know, how did that go? Did you like this? Ba -da 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 -da. And, but the hand would be just adjusting the silverware. So it was exactly the right distance from the edge of the table. He taught employees how to read a table. Uh, there's a great story in the book about how he would seat people in the dining room. One of his lines was, you put the peacocks in the middle of the room so the other peacocks can see them. 
and that, that's amazing because that's the kind of thing like when you eat at a restaurant you don't think you're being like stare no I, you know what i mean i love that the, the people that are what that work there know their you know know the customers and the types and the, the purpose why they're there you know all the reasons that we eat and go out to eat um but they're also watching if they're taught by somebody like Vince or if they've learned this on their own. And there are certainly other equally talented people in terms of that. You watch the body language. Mm -hmm. If you watch carefully, you can tell who's the host for that night. And that means that's who gets the check. Um, you can see if there's perhaps a little distance between a couple, a little ice in the air between them. Mm -hmm. um, this this kind of unwritten communication, facial expressions, gestures, um, that kind of people watching is is a real gift, and to have a staff that knows how to do that is um, is part of why this place uh, has always had such extraordinary standards in terms of that sort of thing. I'm really looking forward to the move. We don't have a definite date for it, but it, I'm, it's going to be interesting to see the new place in Clayton. Oh, in Clayton. Okay. I was about to add, I was going to ask, where is it they're moving to? Uh, it's on Brentwood in the Cin what, the Centene buildings of the southwest corner of Brentwood and Forsyth. Oh, I like that. Those buildings are beautiful. I, yes. I live in Webster, and when I, if you hit the light just right going towards Clayton, they disappear into the sky. And it's just magic. I think that's some architectural magic, you know, because, you know, buildings from the 70s and 80s look heavy. And then that was the, per you know, they look so massive. And those are those particular buildings are just designed. I feel like you could just pick them up and like feathers, they could just fly away. Like they just look so light and beautiful. Yeah, that's, so that's a lovely point. thing to say about it. That's a lovely <laughs> thing to say. So, um, yeah. Any other people, any other characters behind the behind the scenes characters? Oh my goodness, um, six million, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> practically practically every restaurant has somebody in it. One of my other favorites who's also gone was um, the, the husband of the couple that started what is now Cafe Natasha mm -hmm. and the Gin Room. The Baramis came from Iran separately and met in New Jersey. She was a nurse. <laughs> and he was an engineer and he got a job here. And um, uh, this was, they came here before, right? I think before perhaps the Iranian revolution, but not much. Mm -hmm. And he lost his job. And then there was the Iranian hostage thing. And of course the aborted effort to get them out and so on and so forth. And he couldn't find a job. Mm -hmm. So they decided to open a little restaurant in one of the downtown office buildings called The Little Kitchen. And um, the restaurant grew and they worked on it. But Mr. Barami was, you could tell he was an engineer because the details and the perfection. And it was not so much perfection in terms of you know, the place should be nice and all that, and the employees should know. But it was the food that he wanted perfect. Mm. There is a traditional Persian soup, and Persia, of course, is the old name for Iran. There was a traditional Persian soup called Ash. Mm -hmm. And Ash, he started, they started out making it, there's, it's just, it's made with grains, basically, sort of the equivalent of barley soup, for example. And they use the juice from the roast beef they roasted to make sandwiches with. But when they moved from downtown to the place in University City that they'd opened, which originally did dinner and brunch only, there was no more roast beef juice because they weren't doing those sandwiches. They'd gotten full into the, the Persian food and we're doing very well with it. But he, he decided to come up with a vegetarian version of it. Mm -hmm. And he worked and he worked. It has to have the right feel in the mouth. Uh, this was long before anybody talked about umami but I know that's what he must have been work, looking for if he's trying to take the place of roast beef. And um, it took him 
a long time to get it just right. And his next task to not only make it vegetarian, because that was the main reason rather than going out and buying that all using those terrible beef broth cubes, another reason to eschew hospital food, yeah. the beef bouillon. Um, the he he worked on on getting that just right, and then he decided to make it vegan and began working on a way to do this without cooking the onions in butter. And they eventually got it that way, but it took altogether about two years. Wow. But but he he just and he would go out into the dining room and talk to people and he would encourage them, for example, to pick up the lamb chops and gnaw the last of the meat off the bone. <laughs> it was really very tasty. He was a lovely man and I miss him. Hmm. I'm loving these. I'm loving these stories. because I, I love that these em emotional connections that that you bring into the stories as well. I mean, I feel like I've been there now. Like I've now I have this connection, this place that. Uh, although I have been to Cafe Natasha, that is one of my favorites. Well, N Natasha literally was in a cradle that mm -hmm. Mr. Birami had built in the kitchen of the little kitchen. As a baby, she literally grew up in the restaurant, and we're very lucky that Natasha has come back to take things over and establish her own kingdom of the gin room. Yeah, yeah, yes. It's such it a, was yeah. the old the old English line. It was the gin what done her in. Um, <laughs> this is this is sort of the antithesis of that. Yeah, that was that's a good way to put that. Um, and I see Schneid Horse is on here. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so I am, I'm one of those people that uh, I went to Schneid Horse the last week that it was open for the first time. Okay. Which was, uh, yeah, which was not nice of me. And this, I love German food and it's something I love to cook at home. And, and I lived here, I guess that was 15 and a half years then at that point. I was like, I guess I should go there if they're gonna, gonna close. But um, yeah, <laughs> tell me. There wasn't a whole lot of German food on the menu by then. But they did, yeah. use, but they did use G and W sausages. Mm -hmm. G&W is this place in South St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And if you eat sausage, like bratwurst or, or things like that, you need to go to G&W. Mm -hmm. Where You're is that? About that? It's, I think at the cross street is Prather. Um, it's, it's a block, a half block east of South Kings Highway, north of Chippewa mm -hmm. and south of Arsenal. Um, it is indeed very neighborhoody. I'm, you know, there's an old line about if you like sausage, you don't want to see it made. <laughs> Joe and I, well, Joe and I took um, a tour group. We did a benefit. One of the schools approached us and said, "Would you lead a food tour?" And we went to um, a couple of stores and um, had lunch at Cafe Natasha. And um, uh, stopped at a bakery first. And um, what bakery uh, did you stop at? The bakery was on South Jefferson. It's gone now. It's right across from the firehouse. And um, uh, it it had been a bakery for a century. And I'm trying to think of what happened. I was in there after the bakery finally closed, and the mm -hmm. smell had permeated the building. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, long gone, but donuts of, of, you know, the 30s were still, the molecules were still. Anyway, I took the people, I took, we took the people to C and K, um, to G, uh, pardon me, G and W, C and K is the barbecue place. Uh, we took the people to G and W and there were people who were saying, well, you're not going to take them into where they make the sausage, are you? And I said, I certainly am. Um, I'm a nurse. I know clean. I know operating rooms. You could have done surgery in that back room. It was immaculate. It was sparkling. But oh, that's good sausage. That is really good sausage. And they will probably offer you a beer when you come in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Is it a yeah. good St. Louis beer? <laughs> but but Schneidhorst was using G&W sausage 
for sausage dinners and for breakfast and so on and so forth. So, and there's nowhere else you can do that unless you go get it yourself. But it, it outlived its greatness, Schneidhorst's mm -hmm. did. Um, there's did generations that, go ahead. I, was, oh, no. there's I just said that's interesting. That, generations that grew up with uh, wedding receptions and um, business uh, soirees in the private room and so on and so forth. And of course, there was originally a drive-in there, a drive-in restaurant really? there. Oh, yeah. There were two of them. There was one on Hampton called the uh, Big Bevo and uh, that they ran. The family originally, uh, for a while, owned Bevo Mill. And um, there was a drive-in at the side, and the kids would go from there, and they would um, drive down to the park more at um, uh, Kirkwood Road and Manchester, and apparently go after the Kirkwood kids. I would like to call our moderator, if that's possible. My computer is telling me it's going into battery-saving mode. Um, I take it I'm not plugged in here. So you know this place. Is there a plug? Is there a I plug here? There should be a plug back behind. Yeah, plug, plug back. Okay. You. you can wing it for a while. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was very, and I will wing it for just a second, but I was so surprised when I moved here for such a German, so much German history here. I was amazed at how few German restaurants had survived any of that. So, um, well, and it was better in like the 50s. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were places that you could go in the 1950s that um, that were around in South St. Louis still. But I think part of that was that German food was home food. And the other thing is, remember that the anti-German sentiment that occurred first during World War I, Mm -hmm. uh, I think may have had something to do with that going away. I, when I worked at Lutheran Hospital, and these were German Lutherans, I assure you. <laughs> we had little old ladies who, in their dotage, would lapse into their childhood language. Um, on, on Cherokee and over near where the old Sears was on South Grand, there were German restaurants around in the 50s, certainly. Um, I was, I'm not so old that I was nursing then, but I remember them as a kid when we'd come to St. Louis. But, and the other thing is, there's not the glam of the French or the, the, the coziness of the Italian. Yeah. And, um, that's all I can say. On the other hand, you know, we've got this history of great sausage making, and that's where not only the beer, but the wine comes from. Mm -hmm. Our wine making is German in its heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, the discussion of the Missouri River out around Hermann and all that and its resemblance to the Rhine. Um, talk about send word to those back home. Uh, it's very much there. Yeah, I was just recently doing some uh, some research on the. I had found a letter written to um, to James Buchanan Eads from a friend who was thanking him for sending him some. Like he was like thanking him for something, and he said, uh, "Thank you for this wine. I have to admit, I was skeptical at first, but it's not that bad." And I thought, "Oh my gosh! Like I have, this is the best thing." But even in the 1860s, people were like Missouri wine. I don't know. <laughs> And I thought that was really great. But in researching that and learning more about it, there was a time period um, in the 19th century where the wine crop in Europe had a blight that came from, it called, came from Indeed, it was it mm -hmm. was called Bertritis. Yeah, not Bertritis. Um, it's not coming. But yeah, there's a monument to the Missouri rootstock in France yeah. that mm -hmm. saved the French wine crop. Um mm -hmm. And the word is flying through, I think. And yeah, and that came from Missouri. It was not just American. It was it was Missouri rootstock that saved it. And as far as I know, some of that rootstock, some of those plants are still there. Love it. So I think that was that was a cool piece of history to find out that we had saved them, you know. And and it was our state. Um, I think our state ornithologist is the guy that that, that found it. And um, 
But anyway, yeah, that was some yep. cool stuff. So as we're getting close to being done, I have a, I've got to ask, I think probably a cliche question, but one I really want to know is what would have been the next restaurant on here? <laughs> if you, what, what's one that didn't make the cut? That you, like, Oh my goodness. I never <laughs> even thought about that. Um, you know, um, I had, I had a list and it seemed to go, you know, it seemed to go the way it should. And the, the space worked out that way. Um, and you, the other thing is it's hard to pull out, for example, on the Hill, I did not get deeply involved in the very fine restaurants on the Hill, the, the white tablecloth, black tie restaurants. Mm -hmm. But I'm very happy to discover that Giovanni's on the Hill is going to be reopened by Giovanni's two boys. Oh. They, the, there was the fire there a number of years ago and Giovanni himself, who was quite a character, passed away last year, I think it was. I've sort of become the official obituary writer for <laughs> St. Louis Magazine's dining section. Um, but, uh, but the boys are going to reopen the location on the hill and they are gifted in the kitchen and gifted in the hospitality. And I think that's going to be really great. The uh, the Giovanni's that is um, uh, on Le on uh, Ledoux Road, just over the Ledoux Clayton line, is going to close, and uh, I think they're going to remodel Il Bel Lago. So Giovanni's on the Hill is coming back, and I really look forward to that. Um, you know, there there are these there are all of these little things. I I think about. You know, I think about the little spots where I where I like to stop for lunch every once in a while, and, and some of those disappear. I can still get good Cajun food at the place on South Broadway now, whose name eludes me. Oh, uh, um, Broadway Oyster Bar. No, no, no. That's in the book. No, oh, okay. That's in the book. No, no, no. This this is a new little place that is uh, no music. It's down. It's down near the old Lamp Brewery. Okay on the east side of it and somebody will probably you know come up with the name of it it's just not firing on me at the moment but there's all of these things and i'm happy to right now i'm happy to go down on cherokee street i've been jonesing for real street tacos for a while i've really tried to stay in during all this stuff but i'm gonna have to succumb and go find myself a good bowl of menudo at one of the places down there but i don't have i don't have enough stories yet on any of those places to put in the book. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say if you, it, I guess it's an unfair question, but it's a fun one to like kind of think about for a second, which is like if you, if someone's writing this, you know, if someone's writing, you know, the second edition of this in 50 years, I wonder what, what places we go to now will be, will grow to be iconic, you know, and I we'll, think that's, work, you know, <laughs> I think one of the hardest things for restaurants to achieve is a peaceful middle age. Yeah. Um, Trattoria Marcella is a fine example of a restaurant that has done that. Marcella started out so hot, mm -hmm. you couldn't get in. Um, and it, you know, it's enlarged and it stayed not hot, hot in terms of impossible to get in, but they have stayed busy, they've worked hard. Um, they make really good food, and I think the p places that can achieve a good middle age will probably continue to do that way. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there's that criteria I offer you for thinking about it. Yeah, and the and the ones that have been creative, right? In this this time, that were quickly creative and and changing. How, that's been that I can't imagine. Yeah, just the way it's things just. Are. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All I can, all I can say is take good care of the places you love. Please tip well. I mean, I I can do twenty minutes talking about tipping, and when I talk to groups, there are always questions about tipping. But right now, places are in such pain, and if if you, you know, you're not going out, you're not buying new clothes. It's driving me crazy. There are shoes I'm looking at that I know I'm not going to buy because I don't have anywhere to wear them. Um, 
and I can't travel, which is mm -hmm. even worse. I have a new great grandchild that I haven't mm -hmm. seen. Um, and so, you know, so be generous. I know there are people who don't like the American tipping system, but that's what it is. And you can either, you can either be selfless and sharing and kind, or you can be a turkey. Yeah. <laughs> and I choose that word carefully. <laughs> I'm going to put that on a, like a magnet on my fridge. Like, Choose to be, be this like or you today. <laughs> well, I think that's a really great spot to wrap up. But that went really fast. That was, I think you and I could probably chat history, St. Louis history all day long. Um, it's my favorite thing in the world. And I get, to, you know, I work at the Historical Society. And so, which I still can't believe is my, is people pay me to do that. But they're going to they're gonna figure it out at some point. They're paying me to do my dream job. I don't understand. I can identify with that. Yeah. <laughs> I can identify with that. I never thought the time would come when I wasn't nursing. And um, um, I was able to leave it and take this part-time thing into a whole new life. Which is amazing. Yeah. Those of us that get to do that is just, it's, it's magic. And it's, and it's fun to tell other people like it can happen. And, you know, I'm going to get to talk about what you love all the time. Agreed. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is great to chat with you. And I guess we didn't have any questions or anything. I think we would have seen a question pop up. So we just, I think there's, I think we're, I think we're done. I think we just turn this off. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thanks a lot.